recording on this computer. He's very, <laughs> all right. Okay, he very much likes seeing himself in the video screen. So let's go ahead and take a look at our Canvas modules. So Canvas, uh, temple.edu. All right, let's go ahead and log in. And basically we have two things that uh, prime- uh, They are not making some words. They're not making words? Well, that's because they're muted and because they're all listening to me because I'm super important. <laughs> At least I tell myself that. What? So. Um, what is even doing it the word? All right, so if we look over here, let's scroll down. It's a word to his hat. I do need to be able to do class, unfortunately. Hat is, hat a word? Hat is a word, yes. I will take him away in one second. And it's poem a word? Poem is a word. So. And it's beer a word? Beer is a word. <laughs> so. We've got here, I posted this last night. It's what about? Preposal what? and GitHub attention. Okay, so let's go play the chain game. Okay. You want to play the chain game again? Okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> I just played the chain game, so in the mirror. You can look in the mirror. I do want to tell you what you're going to be doing. So there are, we've got ourselves um, basically four, sorry, three things left in the semester. Um, your final project, your final exam, and your track. And I'll be going, final exam, I'm going to try to ixnay as best I can if I, but I've got to discuss that with other faculty members. Laser, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm teaching. <laughs> All right, so the, um, so the final exam, don't worry about that for right now. Um, the um, track I'll go over. The, pro the final exam, I'll also, sorry, the final project I'll also go over, but the final uh, project will be split into four parts, one of which we'll be doing this week. And if that sounds uh, horrendous and horrible, don't, it's not. Take, it's posted right here. But the four parts are preposal, proposal, status report, and final submission. I'm trying to, <laughs> I am trying to make the final project, the final exam. So, so we will see. Um, I, 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 I think that is my preference, but we'll see. Um, but so I will go over what the, with the group work for the final project. Laser, I'm trying to teach class. So this week we are going to be doing the preposal in your in your lab. Um, this is also a chance to get to let you take a break, essentially, or not so much a break, but a breather, right? Because I know a lot of you are still finishing up the Hawaiian lab. So in this lab, you will brainstorm for your final project, um, and this is the laser. Can you can you? Yoink him. <laughs> so um, the so here we don't have to have a good i i uh, have a great you don't have to have a a huge idea or a like a very well you know very well defined idea quite yet. The preposal is more for um for just kind of brainstorming and basically you want to fill out this this markdown file like this markdown like i mentioned last week is a file like mark it's a it's a markup language very easy to write in this is basically header one two hashes means header two so basically that this is really big this is big then three hashes is somewhat big and then four hashes is so it's a way of just kind of doing that so, um, so what ideas, so basically this is what we want you to fill out, uh, you know, by next week. What ideas do you ha have for your final project? If you plan on collaborating with one or two classmates, what are their names? And do you have any final uh, questions of your own? If you're working in a group, by the way, you need to, um, everybody should 
um, everybody still needs to, uh, to uh, submit one of these, okay? Even if you're working in a group, you know, a group with, another, uh, with another person, even if they're identical, you all should submit one. That way we can know who's uh, submitted something. Now, how do you submit something? You'll notice there's not a Dropbox. Instead, um, I want you to get practice using GitHub. Again, if you need a refresher, back to the um, Tuesday's lecture. Um, what we do is want you to create a GitHub account, create a repository, and then host your and then host your document on that repository. Just to give you like a warm up on how to use GitHub. Okay, so that's what we're going to do this week. Next week's lab will introduce the proposal. Yep. We put it as preposal, not proposal, preposal. It's before it's what you do before you propose. So then your proposal is going to be next week, and that's where you have a, a more definite idea of what's going to happen. So for that, you will be basically defining, um, have a much better idea, like what's the title of your project going to be? What is your I um, what is the description of it? What kind of things will you need to use to complete it? And then you'll list three outcomes. Um, you'll list three outcomes. The first outcome is uh, a good outcome. What you will, what you expect to be, what you are pretty much going to guarantee to finish by the due date. The second outcome is a better outcome, which is what you would want to get done by the due date. So good outcome is getting things done that you can ex that you expect to get done. A better outcome is getting the things you want to get done. And then the best outcome is getting everything you hope to go get done because the stars align. Right? Up to 3 people can be in a group. Um to answer your question. So, um now with that said, um the point of this big project is something called is basically getting you exposed to the 90 10 rule, which is that 90% of your time will be spent on 10% of the work because that 10% uh, is boy that's a real bugger. Um, it is it is very common so um, if you haven't noticed it already it's kind of what happens now that so what kind of things can we do for our final project right so. I'm lifting this very heavily from CS50X because I was very impressed with this idea for it. Um, and so what kind of things are we looking for? You could do a web-based application in JavaScript, Python, and SQL based on code that we give you in the web track. More on that in a bit. An iOS app using Swift. A, a game using Lua with love. Note that you don't know any of these programming languages except for Python, and that's okay because we'll be teaching you. Um, an Android app using Java, a Chrome extension using JavaScript. So one idea that like I would find, so what kind of things would be acceptable as a group for um, for final project? Like how simple can they be? So like, um, well, Let's see. So I so let's I'm going to use a story for my um, for my actual um, so another story of basically how com of how computing can make life easier. So I've got um, a very technologically challenged grandfather-in-law, um, and so he he basically had a bunch of old hard drives that had you know, a bunch of pictures on them and he needed us to get them and it was a whole thing. But anyway, I was thinking, boy, wouldn't it have been easier if I just simply wrote a program to find all those pictures? Because, you know, technologically inept here, he's got his files stored all over the place on the computer in places that don't make any sense. Okay. So you, you get to choose what your project is. So just more on that in a bit in giving you your things. So like creating an application that simply says, here's a directory, look for all the pictures in this, in this directory, all the pictures in these directories and the subdirectories and those sub subdirectories and basically find all the uh, files on here and moving, and moving that over there. And just pulling that and pulling those out into a file. Basically simplifying that process for me would have been really useful. 
Um, but that's perfectly acceptable. So doing it by hand took yeah, my wife says that doing it by hand took forever. So um, so let's talk about the tracks then. So to help you give you the skills you need, uh, I we've I've lifted the tracks from CS50. There are three tracks. You get to choose one of them. Although you could do more if you wanted to, but like they're essentially two weeks worth of work here. Okay. So um, there are two weeks of essentially each track is basically two weeks worth of, of work work here. Um, and each of these, and right now, except for games, the others are stubs. But what they are is basically you choose one of them, again, two weeks worth of works. Games is about mobile develop is about developing in a programming language called Lua. Lua is heavily used in video game development here. Um, and it, you'll be using a 2D um, framework um, called Love. And that's a framework in the same way that Unity and Unreal Engine are all frameworks. And what makes Love very useful is, is that it's very good at prototyping because it's very quick to, to code these things. OK, um, mobile apps for one of the two major mobile operating systems is also a track. There's, um, they're the same, except for the fact that you're targeting a different, uh, uh, except you're targeting a different operating system, right? So if you, if you already know Java a bit, if you came in with some Java knowledge or some C knowledge or C++, the Android um, route would be a pretty good route for you. You get to, um, and, and you learn all about the way Android would work. If you've got, if you if you're if you really like Apple um, and want to learn about making iOS apps, you can uh, do that on the iOS track. They'll be the same assignments and the same concepts, just geared in a different programming language. Swift in in iOS. Now the thing is, is that you do need. I believe you do need an Apple computer to basically download Xcode and develop for iOS. So that is kind of the barrier to entry there. So if you don't have an uh, Apple computer, then oof, okay, well, just do Android. Okay, that's okay, though, because those these tracks, as you'll see, will give you the skills. And then finally, you have the web track, which is built into two, which I find I they say that basically that the most challenging track is of these. What is the yeah? It says that they said that the learning curve for the mobile track is hard is higher. But personally, I thought the web app one uh, looked like the most challenging one. So let's go ahead and just take a look at the modules again. So, so actually, I'll go over here. And right now, I'm linking to these, but I'm going to also just copy them over to, um, I might copy them over to Canvas. But here we go. So suppose you click on the games track. OK. So the games track has basically two assignments uh, as part of it. And what you can do is that if you are not particularly inspired by something, you can uh, use these as the basis for making a game. Um, you will basically be making Pong from scratch. Each of these is a video. Oh, I should mention basically that, again, this is, again, two weeks worth of work here, OK? Each of these is expected to basically be two weeks of work for a student. Um, because there's four and a half out. I still got to put the due date down. I'm trying to. I've got to time. I've got to time it out. But, um, but more than two weeks from now. <laughs> uh, but there's about four and a half hours of, of video lecture for each of these, with the videos already recorded for these. So with this, half of it is devoted towards developing Pong. And what you do is you develop Pong all the way up to um, being able to control the. Uh, control one of the paddles, hit a ball. Here, I'll show you actually on my screen. This is what we get with Pong. You see, actually, so this is, yeah. oh yeah, I didn't do it right. Have to put, one second. There we go. It, I put, it was a folder in a folder, so I had to take the folder out. So here is Pong, right? Hit enter to begin and Enter to serve. And there we go. And notice that player two on the left isn't moving. Right? Note that that player over there isn't moving. But everything else works. The physics of this works. Also, it uh, resizes and letterboxes. 
if it right letter boxes, meaning that notice the black bars that occur over here, right? That that it automatically resizes. You get this source code, and you learn how to build it up, right? You learn how to build up to this from scratch, from nothing, okay? And then your job here for this assignment, for this path, is to finish it up by adding the basic AI that will move this. Does it have to be particularly good? No. Like a bad AI would just simply be moving down and up and down and up or tracking this ball. It would be a good thing and trying to hit it back and forth. Okay, so there you go. So you build up to that and then you get to that end. The second part is, of course, building Mario or basically building a Mario clone. Let's take a look at what you get, what you build up to with that. And this is again with Lua. And here we go. And basically you get this. And the goal is essentially to complete that game. Really? Because they go through step by step on how to make this. It's really not, the point is to show you that things aren't as hard as you look, as they look, if you have somebody to help you. In fact, I plan on, my plan for this is basically, I'm going to be doing this myself over the weekend. Yes, you did. So in a couple of weeks, but that's kind of it. But again, this is kind of where I want to go with this. Now, if you were to take this for a final project, you might want to add some different things to, like if you wanted to use Mario as the basis for a final project, which you don't have to, you can do anything you want, but if you wanted to use Mario for a basis of a final project, I maybe, I'm a big fan of genre switching. So basically like for instance, Portal Mario, where basically Mario gets a portal gun, or you know, you play as Samus in a, uh, in, in, in a Mario game, you know, so, those kind of things are pretty fun. Lua is great for prototyping. Um, it's cross-platform. Um, essentially, all you have to do is download this program called Love. And what you do is you just work on, on your projects in this folder. And when you, when you are ready to run it, you drag the folder onto the shortcut. Although there, we do show you how to do it in a bit, a bit of a better way, a bit of a more efficient way. You run it and boom. Lua doesn't look particularly scary, in my opinion. Um, it is, yes, it is different. Here we can go to the main class. Yes, it's different, but look, you'll see that like, okay, require. I wonder if that's like import. It might be. Uh, window height. Window, okay. Random, okay, random seed. So function, love.load. Okay, that's a bit different. But here, instead of def, we use function and end. Okay? And there's the syntax is different, but it's still got the same kind of basics, like if, else, right? And then they apparently just end things with end in Lua. Okay. And here's how it handles with a uh, keyboard. If this was pressed, then return true. Was it released? Yes. How it handles things, uh, how, that it draws things. And again, this builds it up step by step for each of these. So here, Mario Zero, how, to, how you deal with tiles and tile maps. And then they have time tags for each of those things, for basically each section of, of those. Um, here, scrolling, adding scrolling into the game adding controlling into the game so that you can control the game with your keyboard. How do you generate a map procedurally? In other words, making levels is hard. Make the computer do it instead, right? So the goal is to basically finish a level with you know, creating your standard pyramid, like we did in the Mario exercise, followed by a flag. So let's go ahead and take a look at the, um, at the, and again, you can take any of these and kind of use this as the basis to which to start your final project if you don't know what to do. So 
Let's take a look at the, I'll take a look at the Android track over here. Um, there's three assignments here. I might just do two of them because honestly, that's simple enough. Uh, after you, these are split up in, unlike having like a bunch of videos, these are split up into like half an hour, 45 minute kind of like five blocks of half an hour to 45 minutes. Okay. So the, um, so here, you after your first three ones, basically you build a Pokédex. If you, so here you'll you get the standard kind of Pokédex with here's all a list of all the Pokémon and here's their type. What you do to complete it is that you add a search functionality to do to it, and a, and the ability to, um, sorry, and the and and you have it also pull images so that you know there's actually pictures of the Pokémon. Okay. Next, um, lesson four is what they call 50 gram, which is just simply their version of Instagram. So you'll learn how to how to create a uh, image filter, and then in this one you are they again you're working off of code here, where basically you you basically want to give them the user the ability to take a you create your own filter, and if you remember we dealt with filters like all the way back in the first lecture like in or right like during the first week. So you can get some ideas on how to implement a filter there. Um, so just create at least one new filter of your own for creating the app and then learning how to save uh, save photos onto the user's phone because of course if you take the if you alter these photos, you probably want to be able to save them so you can share them with your friends. All right. Are you playing Among Us during class? No, no. <laughs> then why is there a six digit code? <laughs> Testing purposes. <laughs> so, so for the, actually my wife and I played Among Us for the first time last night. So that was pretty fun. Um, so, okay. So with this, and then let's go ahead and take a look at the web track. All right. The web track is, um, I actually like it. There is a lot of stuff here, but basically you are learning how to build a full stack web server from here. So, um, basically you've got H so basically you in these two things, you learn the basics of how things are communicated over the internet, HTTP, uh, TCP IP protocol. Um, then you learn HTML, which is not a programming language. It's a markup language, which is very much you, which resembles a like programming language. In other words, it, it create, gives you a lot of control on how to render things. Okay. CSS helps you control that rendering, makes it very nice. JavaScript is one of those more, it's a language. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, JavaScript is a very powerful language. There's just a lot of people, uh, because it's so easy to learn, there's a lot of bad JavaScript out there. Um, so it's very, it's a very powerful language and it works in basically every web browser. So, you know, it works in every web browser. So it's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, 40, they have a 45 minute lecture here on how to learn that on where they summarize the language and show you how to do it. Um, once you have those things together, you can build a pretty solid homepage where basically you build a homepage using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, and you don't have to host it anywhere. You can just simply run it on local, ho local host if you want to. In other words, just simply your own computer connecting to your own website, your computer connecting it to yourself. So you're using the languages for, for these tracks, you're using the languages because that's the easiest thing to do. Believe it or not, it's pretty easy to learn a language in a couple of weeks um, once you've learned one. The, all every single concept you've learned here maps to every other concept, okay? Um, but for the web one, you do actually get involved with Python because of Flask. 
Flask is basically this extremely powerful web server built in using Python. So um, you create, and so it, it's used professionally. It's really awesome. Um, and it allows you to serve dynamic web pages. Now you may have noticed that they call their fine, and then they also have um, things on databases on how to do that. You might have to go and duck into their lecture on SQL to, if you need to. But honestly, I don't understand SQL and that never stopped me working with the database. So um, now you may have noticed that they, call, that they call their final bit of this one uh, finance. I just simply renamed it to stonks because that made more sense. Um, for those of you who don't get the meme, stonks, right? And in this one, you build a, a fake real, yeah, a virtual stock trading website. It's a fake stock tra trading website, but it uses real data. In other words, the, uh, the, uh, the idea here is that basically you create an account with fake money in it and you, and you make fake bids for stocks and basically see your fake por portfolio grow as you buy and sell. But the data actually, um, but the data that goes with this is um, you're actually gonna be using the AP, actually be, you know, getting this data from, oh, real web sources. Um, now, if you're interested in like, and if you're interested in finance and expanding this, by the way, another idea for a final project is to take advantage of the fact that we learned about Monte Carlo approximations. Monte Carlo approximations are used quite often to try to predict websites uh, or sorry, stock prices. So you putting out projections and seeing you know, what might happen to the stock if you based off of the past hundred days. It's pretty interesting. It's a pretty interesting thing. These kind of predictions, as you can imagine, are pretty useful. Having this kind of data is a nice advantage if you're trying to trade. Now, unfortunately, what these things fail to recognize and cannot sim and are very above the level of us simulating is that these kind of systems, they aren't, you know, you're simulating it as a closed system. So you buy, and sell things, but it doesn't react to you buying and sell things. And so when you do buy and sell things, uh, if you're doing so in large quantities, then the world of finance notices and reacts to those buys and sells and the price changes in response to your buys and sells, which may not be recorded if you're just doing it virtually. So in other words, you know, you're just pretending to play the game. Once you start playing the game, everybody else notices you as a player is the way I put it, okay? Um, TLDR index funds, people. If it, it's good enough for Warren Buffett, it should be good enough for you. All right, so. So those are the kind of three tracks that you can do. If you do want to work in um, Python, if you do want to still want to work on Python and work on your fundamentals and you get through these and you're really not too comfortable still, here's some other suggestions. Take the hurricane um, assignment that we've worked with and build on it. Right now, it just simply uses one thing, but maybe you can perhaps give it the, um, but it gets its data from, but the data we got from it is from AccuWeather. In fact, here we go, bum, 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 bum. looking for the, so here was Hurricane Irma. I had the source code for it at some point, or I think it was Mac. Let's see. Um, let's see. Table. I'm pretty sure that they have a uh, date data. They have the data in a table um, for this, but you could pull this from, but you can pull that data from a um, from a website like this and track it yourself in your own app. Um, somebody asked, can you make a whole new game with Python? 
Python is not the best language for making games it, because of the way it's processed. It's just processes. But if you do want to try making a game in Python, you can use the Pygame uh, mo module. Um, Pygame, so Zweigart. Um, so yeah, I remember that name off the top of my head. Yes. OK. Um, so this is because the guy, he's the same guy who wrote the other suggested textbook, which was automate the boring stuff with Python. So here are, um, and here he wrote a bunch of games in Pygame, including his own Tetris clone, which would also be a fun final project, I think. So Tetris is pretty fun. He's got the source code listed for basically, so here, right, you'll notice that Tetris takes about 500 lines, but he breaks down each of them on how it works. So he goes into each thing. Notice that he kind of creates a template over here to draw them. You'd be surprised. A lot of that, well, let's take a look at some of the lines. It looks like a lot, but look at this. Like the first hundred lines are, let's look at the first hundred lines. In, comment, import. Uh, these are constants, right? These are more constants. Yeah. Um, colors. Setting up the color, setting up certain things to be colors. Um, here's templates for the uh, for the way the pieces look when they spin. So here is your Z shape and how it spins. Here's one of the other shapes and the different orientations it will be in. Right. So notice that basically it's got here like 150 lines before you actually get to any like real code. Um, here it's loading a uh, .mid file. What is an MID file? Notice that it's saying a pygame.mixer.music.load. So it's obviously loading music of some stuff, but what's an MID file? MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface. So MIDI files are not like MP3 files or WAV files or FLAC files or M4A files or anything like that. They don't um, you know that by being by having worked with them and possibly being a, a really into music. Yep, yeah, essentially. So this sec so so MIDI files are basically how things are programmed in music. Uh, they sound pretty terrible on their own because essentially they're just commands. This you press this note on the keyboard at this, and you press it this hard for this long at this pitch. That's what essentially MIDI files are. All, they do include some other information, such as pitch bending, modulation, um, expression. There's all sorts of like commands. It's a very expressive system. Um, been basically, and it's been 40 years since version 1.0, and they only uh, just announced version 2.0. So it's kind of interesting. But MIDI files are essentially they're very lightweight. They're like where they're kilobytes. Um, but they look something like, well, they look something like this. Um, and they're used in a lot of, in basic, in some basic games, if you have a library. Here I've got a, again, a DAW, a digital audio workstation. Let me go ahead, empty. Uh, if you're going to visualize these things, they typically look like here. And yes, I know I use FL Studio. It's very, very, uh, in a, I can after class, so give me, but right now, not so much. So, um, but let's see, let me go ahead and this is actually a great point to, to show you this. Okay, oh, it's just like, why is it not showing up? Where? Oh, maybe it's just everything is on top of it. Interesting. Okay, just close, close, move. Yeah, I suffer from 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 technical difficulties occasionally myself too. It's okay. It happens to everybody. Labs is awesome. Lab. I, I only just discovered Labs this year, and I'm sad that I did not know about it earlier. Um. So okay. So here is a MIDI file. And I'm going to go ahead and 
uh, drag it in. Well, I'll drag it back, but I'm going to drag it into FL Studio now. Uh, specifically like this. I'm just going to drag this guy right over here. Boom. And that's what a MIDI looks like. It's essentially a piano roll of different notes. Um, very, very quiet here. And I'm also not sharing any sounds here, but this is essentially just a piano piece. Now, um, interestingly enough, uh, let's take a look at the files. 87123.mid, two eights. Uh, these are very poorly named things versus like this one, which is a Mario clip that I was playing with to test out a brass thing. So anyway, uh, point being is that um, this is a very odd name. Well, interestingly enough, for those of you, this might interest those of you who are coming from a music background, um, I got that file from Magenta on TensorFlow. Or so that's a Google project. So I'm going to show that to you. Again, I'm trying to show you all sorts of different things you can play with for your final project. So um, magenta.tensorflow.com. So notice it's an open source project. And notice it has Python and JavaScript. So magenta is, so let's see, try, try it live. And I click on this. And it opens up this notebook, what it's called over here, which is just simply hosted on the web. Um, it's a Python library that helps you generate art and music. Um, you And essentially, the way these things work, it's very interesting. You run these cells. So you hit this, making sounds with note se uh, sequences. Here, basically, they create, they manually create the notes for twinkle, twinkle, little star, and then show what we can kind of do with this. It's very interesting what you can play with with these. But I got that MIDI file from a... Um, from one of the demos they have over here, which is, um, let's see, yeah, from this one, listen to Transformer, which is just simply this player of a bunch of different uh, pieces of music uh, that basically were purely generated by a computer. It was modeled over like tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of hours of piano performances on YouTube, but um, they needed some new kind of machine learning on it to try to actually make it sound like music as opposed to, because, because, but anyway, point being is that basically these are completely uncurated um, and you can just simply find one that you like and then you can go over here to share and hit download it as a MIDI. And also notice for those, again, of you, those in music, this may not make sense to you if you're not in music, all samples are released under a CC0 no rights reserved license. What does that mean for the rest of the class? It's up for grabs, essentially. No copyrights. You can do whatever you want with it, which is very important for when it comes to artistic pieces of work. It means not only can you, it does, is it really stealing if they let you use it though? It's more of a gift. So no rights reserved, let, enable scientists, educators, artists, and other creators uh, to waive those interests in their work and thereby place them completely as possible in the public domain. So in other words, you can use them as much as possible. That actually sounds pretty good. So some of these, so so work, and it's my, I'm a very firm believer that the, uh, when it comes to art, that combining human creativity with kind of the randomness that computers can provide is a huge, res uh, huge resource. So being able to, basically get through writer's block by using programs to help, you know, generate new pieces of music. Is it smart to choose a project depending on our job field? I.e., if I were to go into gaming company, would it be smart to choose the gaming project you offered? Eh? I mean, honestly, it wouldn't, ha you could answer it both ways. Like if everything you do is, is gaming, then, well, that's essentially going to be your only strength. But if you've got a portfolio of multiple things, that could also show that you know how to do a lot of different things. Remember, gaming companies need more than just people who can work on games. They also need people who can manage like the kind of social media websites, uh, handle their backend servers, make sure that all the distributed components go down, make sure nobody uh, breaks into um, 
into their uh, into their servers. Say less. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that directed towards me? Because yeah, I know I speak a lot. But anyway, two forty. So. Blank. I assumed that it wasn't towards me or it was a joke. I never really take anything in chat too seriously. So don't worry. Um, but um, so these things are very great. Now, Python makes it very easy to do pro quick programming. Um, but to do a graphical hello world in Lua, it was very short. Lua is very short for programming. So again, as I mentioned, I plan on basically going through the games track myself this weekend to make sure I can do it. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, because I don't have a whale.png. So, but anyway, if you want to get started with love, you go to love2d.org, you get what you need over there. Um, and then you can hit um, the wiki over here. And then you can hit this button, getting started. And here is the hello world for that, which is create a function inside a program called main.lua. And that does, because of the way Lua works, it has to be inside a folder. It doesn't really matter what it's called. Um, function love.draw, love.graphics.print. Okay, that makes, that kind of makes sense. There's uh, something, there's a module called love and inside that module is something called graphics. And then I can call the function on graphics to print something. Okay. And so this is just simply a bit of black magic that I'm going to have to learn. And so then to run it, I drag it over here on love. But if you're using Visual Studio Code, you can actually download a plugin that just enables you to hit Control L or Alt L and it will run automatically. So you can probably make any kind of 2D game in uh, Lua. Um, now, if games of those aren't, now to veer completely into left field, if those kind of games aren't your cup of tea and you really want to work on a different kind of game, uh, there is a module over there called RenP, which you may have heard of if you're into visual novels. The, um, so RenP is used for making visual novels. Um, it is built in Python, and one of my personal favorite games of all time is built in RenP, which is, of course, Doki Doki Literature Club. Um, now, Doki Doki Literature Club is one of those games in, where where it's completely free, but the but the therapy isn't. <laughs> you you don't pay well. You pay for the game, just not with money. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, but anyway, what I particularly like about the game is how it works at, is how it uses and manipulates the, uh, the engine in here to basically modify files on the computer as you go through the game. It's really awesome. Um, and it just kind of really takes advantage of basically pushing the engine to its limits. Um, there's... But basically, these kind of games, they're typically used for like choose your own uh, uh, choose your own adventure romance style games. But there's nothing stopping it from making it a more serious kind of game. Um, a choose your own a classic style choose your own adventure game is always a lot of fun because it's about that's more about creating a narrative, and that's a lot of fun. One of the oldest um, old one of the famous games, uh, Zork. Um, is interactive fiction, and it was essentially this is the game. So essentially, it was just, uh, or rather, here it is being played on a computer. Right? It says here, open the mailbox. Opening the mailbox reveals a leaflet. Ta get leaflet taken. It read read it. Welcome to Zork, and then it tells you what Zork is. All your classes from now on should be related to the final project in some way, shape, or form. Um, be it I giving you ideas for a final project or me showing you some, some 
tips and tricks that I found that I found along the way related to other projects. So for instance, again, Tuesday is election day. Um, I will be holding a special election a day optional class um, and where I'll be do programming a, what I would feel like would be a good final project on gerrymandering. So, you know, that kind of thing would be, yeah, gerrymandering. And if you don't know what gerrymandering is, I will be happy to explain it on Tuesday. It is a, so gerrymandering is, gets to the fact that basically states have a lot of independence in the United States. And, the, and part of that is the ability to draw election districts. Gerrymander, gerrymandering is the act of, draw, of carving up election districts in such a way that you will not lose that district or your party will not lose that district. Um, and depending, now there are various different ideas on how to combat it. Some are good, some are terrible, and some are, I don't know, but there's a lot of things that are built into our election system that make it uh, tricky. So there's a couple of different algorithms though to tell if certain districts are gerrymandered. That's part of the reason why responding to the census is so, is so, um, is part of the reason why, why responding to the census is so important because it's the census that helps draw these, that helps apportion representatives in Congress. And then with those apportionment of, re of representatives, the districts then get redrawn. So your districts get redrawn every 10 years. So there are, so it's a big reason why the census is so important. In fact, uh, computing has actually a bit of a history with the census because we got to the point where basically we had enough people in the country then unless we had machines it would take more than 10 years to count all the all the data we got from the census mm -hmm. so now but yes i will be doing a special a uh, thing on that on Tuesday, on Tuesday. Um, and then on Thursday, I hope to show you a bit more of, of what I've done with the game. So, um, well, there's all sorts of different things you can do with these and they don't have to be particular and I'm not trying to make them particularly onerous on you. The, the honestly, the I'm hoping that the tracks are the hardest part and that the final project won't be too much work from that. Um, so again, choose one of those tracks. Think about which track you would like to do. Um, if you are if you are unsure, I highly recommend the game track. And yes, you will be doing both all those both the both of the assignments that are listed. Um, so that would be both Pong and Mario for the game track because Pong is very useful in building up the basics on how to draw shapes and stuff. Whereas Mario, there's side scrolling involved. Yeah, you have to do both in for these. But the, again, as I showed, the code builds it from scratch. So what you get from Pong, when you write Pong, what you get is you're given this. I didn't write this. This is the code that you are given. Okay. And what you're asked to do for this code is to make it so that this guy over here actually, you know, isn't a dead weight on the board. Okay. With Mario, it's actually um, making it so you have a finished engine. So you just want to complete it yet. Is there a due date for the track yet? I have to figure out what the due date for the final project is yet, but I would imagine, I'm thinking possibly before Thanksgiving, like right before Thanksgiving. All right, so more questions about the tracks and the like. I'm thinking the due date will be before th the week before Thanksgiving break. Since these things are supposed to be about two weeks worth of work, I figure giving you that, that amount of time will be fine. 
And again, it's about four and a half hours worth of lecture. Um, well, if we have an idea that doesn't align with one of those tracks, I still would like you to choose one of those tracks to do. But your expectations for the project would probably be, you know, might be a bit lower as a result. So, I mean, because these are really the three big things that people are focused on when they come into computer science. Right, the track is due th uh, before Thanksgiving and not the final project. Right, okay, last thing, last thing for the final project, right? I don't intend for this to be onerous on you. If it's a basic kind of thing, like you only make marginal improvements to Mario, great, that's perfectly fine. And you'll probably get an A on the project, right? What if my project has a portion, somewhat of a portion of the track? That's great. Good programmers write good code. Great programmers reuse great code. Okay. So the um, so the big thing here with these tracks is that um, is that they are is that they can give you a thing. Like for instance, if you complete the web track, right, you'll have a strong basis going forward to the. Um, you know, you're basically going to have basically a, something that can be used for pretty much anything, um, any kind of web app. Um, one of my favorite projects of all time, I actually, came, of ideas from all time that came from this was actually a, from a hackathon. I may have talked about this in class, but it was essentially, all it was was a website with essentially a button that said, I'm hungry for that. And in the background was, a GIF of a cartoon from Nickelodeon or multiple GIFs. It would like show one for a couple seconds and then show another one for a couple seconds and then show another one for a couple seconds. Okay. And then basically all these tracks, all these GIFs had pictures of different uh, Nicktoon characters eating food. And if they were eating a food you like, you hit, I'm hungry for that. And then what it would do, it would take you to Google map and search and, and automatically pull up all the based on your location, all the places near you that serve that food. So, um, so what is the difference between the final project and the track? The final project can be based on your track. Your track is essentially a choose your own adventure for the last two weeks of what you, of, of not, the, not the last two weeks, but what the next couple of weeks of study is gonna look like for you. Um, the, what kind of assign, and, and the idea here is that if you choose a track, your, your final project might look like that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, sooner rather than later, although if you're basing it off a track, when should you start it? If you're starting your track, if you're basing your final project off of one of the tracks, right, then, then basically by doing the track, you're working on your final project. Right, the track is not your final project. It can be used as the starting point for it though. Right, so for instance, let's take Pong for instance. Pong, right, is a game about a paddle hitting a ball, okay? And you bat, hit it back and forth. But you could take that game and then do, I think, what, breakaway? Not breakaway, um, breakout. Right, it doesn't seem like the game breakout is based very similarly off of the concept of Pong, where so it doesn't seem like it's too hard of a deal to take Pong and turn it into breakout. The goal of breakout, by the way, is that you control a paddle on a ball and you bounce a ball just like in Pong. But instead, what you, of, of hitting a playing against a player, what you're trying to do is hit the ball and break all the blocks. Yeah, so the track is not your final project. And as for when you should start, when you have a proposal ready, which we just are doing the, we're in the preposal state, the brainstorming state right now. So this game is, you know, but this is something that you could easily see and take Pong for, you know. You know, yeah, you could do, yeah, Pac-Man. You could take some of the, you can basically remix one of those old classic uh, uh, games 
a lot of the games are going to be, for instance, it's not too hard to take a game like Mario and turn it into and make Donkey Kong out of it, right? Where, I'm, and I'm talking not Donkey Kong Country, but like original Mario Donkey Kong, where basic, you know, the original Donkey Kong, Kong arcade game. This one where Donkey Kong is throwing barrels at, at a very weirdly drawn Mario and you're jumping and climbing and trying not to get squished by those things. You know, so remixing, taking that project and remaking one of those classic games would be fun, I think, and perfectly acceptable for a final project, right? Learning how to make a game and not only that, but improve it and make it your own or add a twist to it would be great. Would it be okay if it, does it, so is it plagiarism? Hmm, that's an excellent question. I mean, so think about how many, so let's talk about this for a second. Um, in the series Watchmen, right? There is a character called Night Owl, right? Who's a very obvious ripoff of Batman. Is that plagiarism? So long as you're upfront is what your inspiration is, it's generally okay. Plus if you're not, and the only, and besides the big issue would be if you're selling it for profit or you're eating into the profits of somebody else. Donkey Kong, it's okay to make kind of a thing, but don't use Mario and don't use Donkey Kong. You might wanna actually use like, you know, you know, your own kind of sprites and your own kind of villains and your own kind of obstacles. So remix the game, right? We see this with the with what happens on, on when, when like a game like Flappy Bird comes out, that there's like a billion clones that come out or Angry Birds, a billion clones come out of that, you know? So we see that happen with a bunch of games. Is that plagiarism? Eh, not really, but it's certainly not, you know, it's certainly, but as far as like learning how to write a game, when we're looking at this for an educational standpoint, not for a point of making profit, right? When we're looking for it as to learn mechanics and mastering mechanics, that's certainly acceptable, right? What's not not acceptable is grabbing somebody else's code and yoinking it over and saying, oh, this is my code. And uh, when, it, when it's clearly not. That's definitely plagiarism. But taking an idea that somebody else already has and like making it your own and putting your own spin on it, right? Like again, I'm gonna bring up like Mario with portals, right? What if Mario clean, uh, teamed up with Valve and, um, and basically made a game that um, yeah, what if Mario came up with a game and basically it had portals? Right, as you can see, this is clearly Mario, but nobody's like trying to make money off of it. It's just kind of a, um, it's just a fun kind of experiment. Okay. And the other big thing about it is that everybody is, the other big thing about that is like, with, when it comes to like the intellectual property stuff, everybody's upfront about like, no, of course I didn't create Mario, right? Everybody knows that I, of course I didn't make Mario. He's been around since before I was born kind of deal, right? But like, so long as you're like saying, this is my clone of this game and I put my own couple kind of twist, that's perfectly fine. Um, Other questions with regards to uh, regards to the final project. Um, again, for those of you in the music department, before I completely forget, because I meant to mention this, right? Um, you may notice that um, so there are some programming languages for music. Max, uh, what is it? Max MLP or Max MSP? I forget what it is. Um, but with regards to FL Studio, if you happen to be a fan of that. See, tools. 
or I'm sorry, under view, we can see script output and we've got a Python interpreter here. And what that does is that, that you, is that there are scripts to control. You can write scripts in Python to control hardware controllers. So your MIDI controllers or your MIDI sliders. So doing, creating something to, that interacts with your hardware that you have, such as an Akai, such as one of your an Akai MIDI play, uh, controller or, an, or Novation MIDI controller or a Korg MIDI controller. You know, so long as it's basically a MIDI controller that's detected by the computer, you can try your you can maybe try to interact with it and see what you can do with that. So there's all sorts of things you can. So there's again all sorts of directions you can take your project. And again, in the preposal thing, what you should what you should do for the preposal thing is think of various ideas, think of what it might take to get them done, throw out a couple because you realize they're unrealistic. You know. Um, and that's also why we want you to submit the proposal. It's sometimes hard to tell what's realistic and what's unrealistic, right? Um, I think I've showed this uh, in a comic before, but it's very important, right? So when a user takes the photo, the app should check whether or not they're in a national park. Sure, easy GI global information uh, system lookup. Give me a few hours. Yes, or it's a location kind of thing. And then check whether the photo is of a bird. I will need a research team in five years. In computer science, it can be hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible. And the, the, uh, the subtitle for this is in the 1960s, Marvin Minsky assigned a couple of undergrads to spend the summer programming a computer to use a camera to identify objects in the scene. He figured they'd have the problem solved by the end of the summer. Half a century later, we're still working on it. So, you know, it can be very hard to kind of guess, but that's also why your TAs are here. Um, but like doing something like that, giving a photo and given the metadata in the photo, you know, like maybe drawing something on Google Maps, that would be pretty cool. Um, it's not too hard to interact with the Google Maps API or again, just simply replicating this first problem. Are you in a national park? That would be a pretty cool project too. Um, now with the, all right, so again, I don't want it to be particularly onerous. If you take your track and just make some minor modifications on it, for this semester, I think that's perfectly acceptable, okay, for your final project. However, to give you a bit of a carrot, the three best projects are going to get automatic A's. That means you don't have to take the final, assuming there is one. And that's the three best projects. So if you're, so everybody in that three person group would be able to, uh, or up to three person group would be able to get uh, out of doing that. Get an automatic A in the class, no matter what else you've done. RTX Flappy Bird. <laughs> So, all right, so that's, uh, and the best will be determined by both me and by me and the TAs. We will simply do that. Yes, it's my class. I get to kind of, it'll be me and the, it'll be us and the TA. Again, and again, it's not like, like the three worst ones will get thrown into a lake of fire, like the ring of power. It's just, um, you know, it's it's more the three best ones get automatic A's. And again, I'm going to look and see if I can't get rid of this final because this semester seems rather silly for that. But, you know, it might be something silly on my end too. All right. So other questions about the final exam. I've considered basically swapping the weight of the final project and the final exam for this semester. But in that case, I would want to have a bit of a higher expectation for the final project. So regardless, I think I wouldn't worry about the final exam right now. But the um, but I would highly 
but I, I hope that you, I've managed to get you all excited for the, uh, for the prospect of, of the final project rather than being fearful of it. The idea here is that between web development, mobile phone app development, and game development, these are kind of the three big things that people think of when, when you think of computer science or creating applications using computer science. And so you'll get, be able to get a pretty real taste of it. Something, you know, to, to basically show your friends and family. This assumes you have friends, but I mean, um, <laughs> the, uh, but these are really, but these are things that are really cool. And furthermore, they're the kind of things you can put on a portfolio, on GitHub to get yourself noticed, to say, hey, look what I've done in class. It's perfectly acceptable to build your portfolio with things you've done in class. So with that, I don't think I really have anything else to discuss for the day. Um, I just, so what, here's my plan, my, so, on Friday and Monday labs, you're going to be go going over the proposal, and so create a GitHub, get that working, submit your uh, your your markdown file. Markdown again is just like a text file, okay? Um, what you are going to do it, and, and again, catch up on any kind of work that you need to do. I'll run the runestone grader to make sure that we catch up, so that I catch everybody who's 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 not taken it yet. Uh, furthermore. Um, I will be working this weekend on completing this on completing the games track. In other words, I'll be doing it myself to make sure that it is actually feasible. And I just didn't say, and I just didn't give you a uh, Sisyphean task without without realizing it. So, you know, um, and if it is a Sisyphean task, then I will simply use use my know how to make it easier. So. I'll be doing that. Tuesday will be election and Thursday I'll probably do show and tell. Um, but do people need more time on the pig lab? lab? All right, so let's go over here. All right, so let's go over here. When did I make it do? I'll run it tomorrow. I'll do the auto grader tomorrow. Just, I, again, I lost my power. We fixed the wire and it was like a bad wire. It was a faulty wire upstairs that had to get repaired. So we just fixed that. So now my computer, my main desktop over here, um, which I brought downstairs because I thought we were gonna have roof work done, but because of inclement weather, we haven't been able to. Um, we will, you know, I'll finally be able to put that up back upstairs today for at least for the weekend and then get back to work. I've been working at my kitchen table, which, well, perfectly feasible. The, you know, dining room chairs aren't necessarily the greatest for back support. Um, anyway, pig is due November 2nd. Also, people keep walking through the room and just yeah. Yeah, there is that, Annie. P Annie said, P can we do next Friday for, oh, well, let's see, when is it due? I have it due November 2nd, right before election day. I mean, it might be a bit longer. I can push it back a couple days, but I don't want to push it back too far because I do want to make sure that you get everything done in time. Thursday, I think, would be good. Let's go with Thursday. Because again, this is kind of the last lab assignment. The other two assignments, I'll put, I'll make check marks for you to do over the next couple of weeks. That's my plan. So things will be get more well defined. Again, your proposal, which is pretty short, I'm not going to budge on that. Okay. So the preposal we will move um, to. So the preposal again, that's going to be due the very next day. So be sure to do that. That's due November sixth. That's due next Friday. Because again, you're just essentially completing a form, creating a GitHub account, and putting it online. So that basically, it's, 
that should be no more than a couple hours of work. This will, these will probably be set to be due right before uh, Thanksgiving break with your status report due right after Thanksgiving and then probably your final project will be due on the last day of class. That very, not last day of class, but like that last day of classes right before the break day. The Pong and Mario, you have to, so you do everything under the tab. Um, I was saying the final project will most likely be due like the day, the day before you get those two study days. Right, so the like last possible day of class. All right, last thing. So for simplicity's sake, for the final project, you'll submit your file, you'll be submitting two things. Obviously your project, but because, you know, submitting your project is, your project's probably very big and it would take a lot, a lot, long time to demo. And I don't want to try to demo everybody like in a huge high panic situation, especially right after the, um, the fall break, you'll be submitting a two minute video um, on basically uh, give us a two minute video recording showing, walking us through your final project. Will you demo the tracks then? That's the idea. So I'll put more details on that, but I just wanted to give you enough to get started on that. All right. So, all right, well, I hope everybody has a good day despite it being really wet. All right. Huh. Weird that it returned to it. So is it? So we have the option of tracks or sort of doing our own thing for the final project? No, you have to do a track. But your okay. final project right. can be, yeah. So you have to do a track. And then the final project, that's pretty much up to you. All right. And it can be based off of any of those tracks if you want it to be. Or you can do something exciting on your own. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm trying to get basically most of the instructions down here. But so long as you follow the tracks, you're going to be good. And yes, the tracks you're going to essentially be doing on your own. They have video lectures attached to them. Although I might be doing supplemental stuff in class. Again, I heavily recommend the games if you are unsure as what to do, because that's the one I'll be running through. Uh, professor, uh, is there like a video explaining the GitHub on, pipe, uh, on Canvas? That was, yes, Tuesday's recording. Got it. Yep, thanks. OK. And then there's a lot of guides online on how to use GitHub. GitHub is very, very common. It's very, very. It's very, very easy to get started with it. Awesome, thanks. Oh, okay, that's a ghost. I was just wondering what that was in the chat. All right. All right, Jenny, I'm not sure really what happened with that. I'll have to take a look at that again. Um, I might just have to fix it in Canvas after I run everything the last time, so. Um, I will be recording this. Yeah, I, I try to upload all my recordings. So once this class is done, I'll stop. It'll stop recording. In fact, I'll stop recording right now.